Hello everyone, welcome to Cloud Native Live, where we dive into the code behind Cloud Native. I'm Annie Tolasso, and I'm a CNCF ambassador as well as a senior product marketing manager at Camunda, and I will be your host tonight. So, every week we bring a new set of presenters to showcase how to work with Cloud Native technologies. They will build things, they will break things, and they will answer all of your burning questions. So you can join us every Wednesday to watch live. Um, so this week we have Kiverno um, to talk about what's new with Kiverno, which is really exciting. So, and as always, a bit of housekeeping to kick us off. So this is an official live stream of the CNCF, and as such, it is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. So please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that Code of Conduct. Basically, please be respectful for all, for all of your fellow participants as well as speak, uh, presenters and speakers. So with that, I'll hand it over to the speakers to kick off today's presentation. Okay, uh, thanks, Annie. Hello, everyone. Uh, let me quickly share my screen, and then I'll start the presentation today. Okay, let me know if you cannot see my screen like, like the slide stack. All right, I guess that's a yes. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to like uh, this uh, CNCF webinar for Kiverno. And we're gonna talk about like upcoming features in Kiverno 1.6.0 release. And today, you know, just uh, a few like uh, background about the speakers. Today we have Chip Zoller and uh, I'm shooting down. We're, we're both Kiverno maintainers. And Chip is uh, the one focusing on like contributing to all different phases of Kiberno except for like developing. And I'm currently leading the, the Kiberno project on the development side. All right, uh, so today we're gonna have, this is like then overview of the uh, topics for today. We're gonna have a quick introduction of Kiberno's architecture and the structures of, of the Kiberno policies. And then we'll jump directly to the uh, new features in Kiverno. And we have a whole bunch of like uh, different demos today, uh, like, and we'll show you like how that new features work in the in the Kubernetes cluster, right? And uh, we'll take the questions at the end, but if you have like, in case you have any questions popped up in between, feel free to pause us there and I will happy to help. All right, um, so like for the Kiverno high level architecture, as you know, like the Kiverno is the Kubernetes policy engine, uh, which is native to Kubernetes, and it runs as the emission controller, which registers remutation and validation webhook configurations in order to, to like inject defaults and validate configurations uh, based on the emission reveal data. And uh, based on the policy decision, Kiverno can either reject your resource creation or uh, operation, or just uh, like simply let it pass and audit the results to the policy reports. And besides that, uh, in the mutating webhook, Kiverno also verify the image signatures as well as the attestations. And uh, you can also look up the data from the external registry and uh, to further utilize that in your inner policy. And in addition to that, Kiverno also runs this generate controller, which is triggered on the emission webhook and generates this intermediate resource or a CR called generate request. And uh, the generate controller will pick up the generate request later and apply the, pol the generate policies on, on the, uh, like the trigger resource. And other than that, Kiverno also generates the policy report which is just, you know, like audit the policy results in this uh, policy report CR. And uh, then you can have the aggregate view of, of the results of the policy decisions, right? And other than that, Kiverno runs a monitor in the webhook server, which keeps monitoring the webhook status and uh, as well as managing the Kiverno secrets and config maps. So basically, this this is the high level architecture of the emission controller of Kiverno, and Kiverno also provides the CLI two that allows you to apply policy without the cluster, and you can also use the CLI automate that in your CI/CD pipeline to mutate or validate configuration. 
Okay. And uh, so this is like the structure of a Kubernetes policy. And a policy here is just the Kubernetes CRD. And you can create like multiple cluster policies of policies as the Kubernetes CR. And then in each policy, you can define one or multiple rules. But then each rule, you will have like this match and exclude block to select uh, various resources based on different uh, information. And then in its rule body, you can specify one of those four type of rules to uh, mutate, validate, generate resources, as well as verifying image signatures and attestations. Okay, so this really is, you know, just a quick entry of Kiverno. There are a lot of like good resources out there uh, for the introductory uh, and how, how you can use Kiverno to apply the basic mutate validate policies. And uh, today we're just gonna like mostly focus on the new features in 1.6.0 since uh, this is the big release after the KubeCon last year, October. And uh, this release includes a lot of new features and critical enhancements. So we're gonna highlight them, uh, some of them in today's uh, session. Okay, so uh, the first thing I wanna uh, talk about is this Im image verification policy. Um, with Kiverno 1.5, uh, we have this type of rule enabled to you know, verify the image signatures that are signed with or without the keys. And uh, you can use this tool called cosign to sign the image and it uh, has this keyless key signing ability so that in Kiverno policy you just need to create the root or uh, provide the root CA so that Kiverno can validate or verify your image signatures using the, the provided certificate. And uh, I want to like uh, what's new in 1.6 is this uh, use Kiverno policy to verify image attestation and there, there was a recent new feature added like uh, to you know, look up image data from external registry. And then uh, the image, the background scan is also enabled for this type of rule so that you can have the policy report based on the configured image verified policy, right? So before we jump to the demo, I wanna like, you know, just give you a little bit background about the, the attestations. So uh, we use this tool called InTotal, uh, and it is like a Linux foundation project, which has a like a standard attestation format. And as you can see here, within a attestation statement, you can uh, either like custom customize customize payload or uh, define some of the build in payload, and later use that. Uh, in Kiverno policy to validate configurations, right? So the attestation is just uh, something you can sign that and attach to the image and then store it in the registry. And Kiverno by default, if you have such policies configured, it'll, it'll look up from that registry and get all the attestation statements. Okay, that's, that's a little bit background about attestation. Let's switch to my uh, to the policy I have for today, and uh, we have a few demos for uh, for this image verify type of rule. Okay, so the first thing we have here is a Kiverno validate policy, and as you can see here, I set the validation failure action to enforce, which means I want to reject the the resource creation or operation if if there's any violations on my incoming resource, right? And then uh, in, in its rule body, I'm just trying to you know, specify this verify image rule and uh, it's matching uh, the image coming from my own registry and it provides the public key to verify the image signatures. And this, this attestation attributes, I'm just saying that, okay, I wanna verify my image is coming from the right branch and the reviewers of the image has to be in this uh, like the listed reviewers. And uh, before we do that, I wanna show you the image, like the test made image I've just built. Uh, as you can see here, it's a simple POS container, which is used in Kubernetes, and it has the signature ready, uh, because I've 
you know, sign the sign the image with the private key and push it upstream. And then uh, after that, I just want to verify the attestations in the image. So far, it doesn't have any. So let's see what happens if I create, if I install the policy and create the, the, the resource or a pod using the image that doesn't have any attestations. Okay, so uh, like I'm running a Kubernetes 123 cluster and currently I have Kubernetes installed. Like this is the latest uh, 1.6 release candidate. Let me just check the tag on that. Right, it's running Kubernetes 160 RC1. And then so far I don't have, I don't think I have any policies installed, right. So CPOL here is just the short name of the cluster policy. You can either uh, like do Kubecuddle get cluster policy or uh, Kubecuddle get CPOL, it'll return you uh, the existing cluster policies. All right, so let's create the policy first. Let's say Kubecuddle apply, check review. In that case, uh, I wanna verify the policy has been installed and it's, it's becoming ready, right? So it indicates this policy is ready to serve the emission request. Okay, so now we have the policy in place and let's see if I run a just a, a standalone pod using my POS container uh, image, which does not have any attestation information, right? So let's create that pod. And ideally I should see a uh, kernel blocks that resource creation because, okay. The, the, the signature doesn't match, right? So this rule is actually blocking the resource creation. And then um, this, remember this cosign CLI2, it also provides the attest command for you to sign the attestation and attach it to the image, uh, like the container image, and then a uh, push up string, right? So let's invoke, let's run that command called the test. Uh, by the way, before I do that, uh, I, I want to, you know, add these attestations to my image and saying that, okay, uh, th this image was built from main branch and this is the reviewer who re re reviews that image, right? It's just the, 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 the simple uh, information here. And then uh, if I run cosign attest with the key and then uh, I attach the entire review JSON, which is a attestation with this flag and uh, attach the container image here, then it'll sign the attestation and attach it to the container I have, right? Just entering the password for the private key. Okay, so now uh, our, our container image should have that attestation. Let me quickly refresh that. Okay, good. Now you can see there is another like signature here, which is which has this dot att that's that's indicating the attestation has been added to your to your container image, right? And then let's run the pod using the same image again. And in this case, because you know the, the image is coming from the main branch and it's reviewed by Bob, then uh, Kiverno just allows that uh, pod creation. Okay, so this is just a, like an example of how you use Kiverno to verify the image attestations. Let me just quickly pause here and see if we have any questions. Okay, I uh, guess. Not so far, um, but hopefully we will get more and more as we go along. Okay, uh, I think I can just proceed from here. Yeah. All right, and uh, the next example I have is to look up image data from your image registry and use that in uh, like the validate or the mutate policy for the policy application, right? So again, I have a cluster policy here, uh, which is matching the pod. And simply I'm just filtering out, filtering out the delete request and this, with with this validated rule, I'm gonna iterate through like each container images and trying to calculate the image size, right? As you can see, I have defined the context attributes here 
and it's trying to use this James Pass operation to get the size of that image and uh, and stored in this image size policy context variable, right? And this variable is later consumed by the deny rule. And here I have a condition say that, okay, if my image size is greater than two gig, then block the resource for me. Otherwise, allow, allow the creation, right? So let me clean up the previous uh, like cluster policy and then I'll delete the workloads, the pod I just run like a pod cache. And then apply that uh, like block image policy to the cluster. Okay, let's check whether the image is ready or not. It's not ready yet. Okay, now it became ready. And then uh, I'm gonna create, uh, first I'm gonna create a, uh, like a busy box pod. Um, you know, apparently busy box size is, is, you know, there's no chance it exceeds the limit, right? So as you see, the, 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 the busy box creation should be allowed. And let's just execute the command. Let's say demo dash dash image, busy box one of 28. And in this case, Kiverna look up the, the image data and tries to calculate the size of the busy box image. And after that, um, you just see the pod creation pass, pass through. And then uh, I'm gonna create another like a uh, pod using this large cluster, uh, sorry, large image, uh, which its size apparently exceeds two gig. And uh, you know, ideally, Kiverno should block that resource creation for me. So let's run that command. Okay. Now you can see that, okay, uh, my policy block large images, just block the uh, demo log creation because the image size exceeds two, two gig. All right, and uh, next I'm gonna have another like uh, policy leveraging the image data that it's being used in the take policy. And it's try just trying to resolve, uh, replace the image tag to the resolved ref. Again, here I have a cluster policy matching a pod and trying to filter out delete initial request. And there I have this for each mutate rule defined. And again, trying to iterate through container images and uh, store that resolved image information to this policy context variable. And, the, and this, this variable is later used in this mutate patch strategy merge pattern and uh, it is trying to replace the image by its reference. Okay. So let's uh, apply the policy to the cluster, say resolve, and then, uh, okay, let's do that uh, pause image again. So if I run, do I have that? Let's try. Um, okay, it's a wow. All right, I don't have that. That's great. So uh, you can see the pod been created, and if we inspect the pod like uh, image, you'll see that um, the image should be replaced by its resolved reference instead of uh, like uh, the image I specified in the command. Okay, this is then an example of the uh, like. Uh, how how to use uh, image data and the validate and mutate policies. All right, and uh, going back to the slides, uh, uh, there was I'm a good gonna... question from the audience as well. Um, we got some answers in the chat already, but if you want to expand a bit, so there was uh, Santor asking about share the got details. Thank you. And then there was uh, Amir asking about um, James Bath, um, which is a query language for JSON. So um, if you want to expand yeah. on those, yeah. OK, I saw them are, are already answered, and uh, some of the links are provided. But 
if you want to learn more about JMS Pass or the uh, that type of policy, feel free to you know browse our like your own website, and we have all the documentations ready uh, like on this on this writing policies page. And also, we're working on like one six uh, release, uh, trying to you know. Uh, publish everything uh, along with the uh, Kiruna 1.6 release. And to just expand on the on the James path, because this is the theme that that comes up uh, pretty frequently in Kiruna policies. Just a real quick overview. You can obviously go and read the link, but James path is just a query language for JSON that we use internally to perform filtering and selection on complex data structures. And this is beneficial because it's not a you don't you can get many of the powerful things that that you need to by policy without having to write a programming language so by tapping into a filter language we can allow some pretty complex expressions to be built to do pretty much anything or most things for sure that you need to do with policy so a little, little bit of background on james path and you'll see that across many caverno policies it's not a requirement but some things uh, you you may need to use James Path for. Others, just a simple pattern statement. Perfect. And then there is an um, extra question. So Amir continued, what if we want more complex mutations? Yeah, I mean, it's like with with most use cases, if, you're, if your use case gets more and more complex, then you may need to involve some James Path. Um, but for simple mutations, you may not need any. Um, if you need to, if you do need to do complex mutations, whatever the definition of that is, that may be well, number one, stating what your needs are. And then if you look at the documentation and we, we try and keep the documentation pretty up to date and, and, and pretty descriptive of all the, the capabilities, you can see examples of how that would be done, including in the policies which Shuting is showing. And I'll, I'll show these a little bit later, but we've got an easy way that she's pointing out to filter mutate so that you can uh, you can see how that's done to solve either your use case or in many cases it may already be done you just pick it up and use it right exactly so currently we have 22 mutate policy samples here available on the website but uh feel free to browse it but uh if if it cannot address your use case feel free to reach out and we'll definitely uh add that to to our sample post perfect uh then there's one additional question more. So, so I'm going to continue. So, we cannot use scripting languages like Lua or something. Yeah. Uh, right now, the scripting language that we're enabling is James Path. It's not a bring your own scripting language. We are evaluating some ways to maybe bring your own uh, language, like maybe JavaScript or something. But as of right now, um, it's really just one. And quite honestly, we found that with James Path. There are, I mean, at least in my my experience, and I, I uh, keep to a lot of what the community is doing. There haven't I haven't run across much, if anything, that can't be accomplished with Caverno policies and James Path. I'm sure there are some use cases, but they're probably not fairly they're they're not prevalent. Right, and we're we're also avoiding like uh, doing external costs if. If we enable like the JavaScript, uh, there is no control on that, right? So currently, Kubernetes can look up data from existing clusters through config map, through API calls, and uh, this image, uh, like uh, data lookup, which is recently added. But that that's all, like uh, for the lookups of Kubernetes. So uh, that's one of the other reason we're just kind of hesitating adding that to uh, the Kubernetes. Perfect. Thanks for the extra info and uh, keep the questions coming up, everyone. We will answer as we go as well as in the end. So thank you so much for the questions so far. Okay, thanks. Sounds good. Let me just uh, continue from here. All right. And there are also a few other critical enhancements we added to Kubernetes 1.6. One is related to the uh, Kubernetes performance. As we've seen that in Kiverno prior, prior to Kiverno 1.6, the, the memory usage uh, grows uh, if you have like a large scale of clusters. And uh, the reason for that is we use this dynamic informers in the background controller. And uh, you know, by default, the Kubernetes informers maintains the in-memory cache for that. 
So if you have thousands of load uh, resources and so in the cluster, kernel memory would grow in that case. And with 1.6, we kind of moved away from dynamic informers in the policy controller. And it's been verified that uh, the memory usage was reduced from around like 400 meg to 200 meg with 80 crown jobs and 10K config maps scheduled in the cluster. Right. So just in general, we don't want Kiberno like memory usage to grow if especially uh, when you're running it on the on the large scale of clusters. And we're also uh, in the in the release candidate of 160. Uh, we're trying to collect more data on that and keep monitor the, the, the memory usage in the future. OK, and another related is like uh, how you use Kiberno, like how Kiberno deals with failure scenarios. Right. We've heard of like some of use cases uh, from the community that the user shuts down the, the an entire cluster, at least the data plan uh, at night, and then restart the cluster in the morning without terminating Kiberno gracefully. So in that case, when you bring back your cluster, there could be a chance that um, Kiberno is not recovered yet. So the admission webhook configurations will block all the resource from recovering, right? So in that case, in 1.6, Kiverno enabled this namespace selector by default for you to exclude the namespace dynamically, especially you know, for the namespace like Coop system, another default namespace, you may want to exclude the workloads in those namespaces. And you can also configure the failure policy for webhook configurations uh, per Kiverno policy. And by doing that, um, like for example, if you set the failure policy to fail, in that case, if if webhook is not responding, or if there's any error uh, of the of of the emission webhook, Kubernetes will just reject the emission request on that. Uh, otherwise, if you have it set to ignore, then uh, after the timeout, Kubernetes will just allow everything to pass. Okay, and uh, we also have this dynamic webhook, which is introduced in 1.5. Uh, so this is something a Kiverno will automatically manage the webhook configurations based on the installed policy. That is to say, when you don't have any policies installed in your cluster, then Kiverno won't impact any of your uh, like the cluster workloads or the resources. Okay. Uh, one last demo from me uh, for today is the namespace scoped failure action. So uh, as you seen in the previous demo before, some of the resource creation got rejected because I have the failure action set to enforce. And uh, in that case, like especially for a cluster policy, you can only control the failure action across entire namespaces. And with this override ability on the failure action, you're able to make exceptions for Kubernetes namespaces and you know, simply either like to enforce or audit uh, the, the policy violations, right? So the example for that I have for today is this validate policy. Um, so let's look at the root body. It's trying to match the pods and verify uh, the pods has to have this label app defined uh, under, under the lab labels block, right? And here by default, the failure, ac uh, failure action is set to audit. Well, I have this overrides defined, and then I'm saying that this, within the prod namespace, I'm enforcing the workloads and, uh, and the pods must have this label with a key app. Right. By the way, uh, Kiverno automatically handles the pod controllers like deployment, uh, stateful set, and others uh, by converting the, uh, adding the additional autogen rules to the policy. So uh, let's just quickly uh, apply the policy. Okay, let me just clean up the previous one because I don't want uh, my resource to be blocked by any of the previous policies. Uh, okay, after that, let's apply the policy to the cluster, say override failure action. And then uh, once I have it ready, okay, it's ready now. 
Uh, so I'm going to create two pods, one in the default namespace and another in the prod namespace, uh, both without the label app. And uh, the expected behavior is that uh, the default pod, like the pod in the default namespace should uh, be, be allowed while uh, the pod in the prod namespace should be blocked. So let's say uh, kubectl run, what should be name I use? Like test failure action and let's run the nginx image in the default namespace. So apparently you can see it's been, uh, the, the creation has been allowed. And if I try to schedule it to the prod namespace, so in this case, uh, the pod creation was blocked by kubernetes. Um, that's that's how you can control like make exceptions on 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 the on the on the namespaces. So a couple of questions that came up here, Shuting. Uh, the label pattern uh, is that a regex, and can you explain what the label pattern does? Right. So uh, yes, indeed, it's a regex, and uh, it's just trying to say uh, you must have this label defined on your incoming pod or the workloads, and the question marks. I recall it's it, it indicating that you must have at least one, and the star, uh, the star uh, like a uh, character is trying to match uh, any of the patterns. And what are the possible action types that are available? Right, the action type. Uh, so currently, we support uh, creation, update, delete, and connect. Connect is something like when you exact tries to exact into a, a Kubernetes pod. Uh, so the, the emission request is sent with the connect uh, type of operation. So that's four types of uh, operations. And for the policy, if the question was more around what are the action types that a policy can take, there's really two. There's audit, which means that the resource will be allowed, but it'll be reported on in a policy report. And there's enforce, right. which means that the uh, object will be immediately blocked. Yes. So enforce exactly. and audit are the two options. Right. The failure action only supports enforce and audit. OK, cool. All right. OK, I guess that's uh, all the demos from me for today. Let me quickly stop share, and I'll hand off to Chip. He will talk about like a, a few uh, new operators, Jamie has passed operators and uh, the updated uh, journal policies. Yeah, thank you, Shuting. Let me go and put this in. And I realized I hit the wrong button. But uh, one thing that I'll mention that uh, reminded me from uh, Shuting's last slide that may not be fully appreciated is the uh, when she showed the screenshot here of the validation failure action overrides, you'll notice that this is a cube control explain command. And everything in Converno, all of the CRDs are open API v3 schemas, which means that you can do an explain on any aspect of any portion uh, of a Converno policy or a report. And it should tell you what it does, what it means, and how to configure that. And that's a super helpful thing, as I'm sure. Uh, you all know, but uh, you don't have to necessarily go and dig in through the documentation or go look at PRs. Just cube control, explain whatever you want, and it'll tell you how to go about writing that that policy object. And uh, shifting in folks, if there are any questions as I'm going through this, uh, either just stop me or we'll get them in the uh, we'll get them in the end. Um, so I want to keep uh, going where Shitting left off as far as some of the new things that are coming out in 1.6 and also show some demos around these. Um, first thing is we've got several new operators that make it uh, even easier or in some cases allow some new policies to be written. And for those that aren't familiar, operators are just a way of when you're building an expression in a Caverno policy, rather than uh, stating, you know, what uh, the pattern, if it's if it's a simple pattern that works well in a lot of use cases, but in other use cases, you need to be more expressive around, you know, what, what things should be checked, how they should be checked, and in what set they should be checked. And so 
Um, these operators are useful in preconditions, which are a way to determine whether a policy is actually going to fire. It's, uh, it's sort of an intermediary in between uh, a match statement and the actual policy body. So you can further refine with a precondition based on these operators and an expression that you build, whether this policy should actually apply to an incoming object. And also in uh, validate policies, we have uh, a type of validate that is a deny. So a validate rule is just saying, I want you to make sure that it looks like this. And a deny just inverts that and says, go ahead and block if it looks like this instead. And so in both cases, we can use these operators. And we have got four new ones here, and it's any in, all in, any not in, and all not in. And let me flip over and demonstrate how this uh, works. So I'm looking at a, a policy here that uses the all in operator. And so in our validate message here, we're doing a, a for each and just looping through all of the containers, the ephemeral containers and the init containers, and we are interested in knowing uh, if any of these two values, so in this case we're looking at add, the objective here is to drop any pod that has any container that's attempting to add both of these capabilities together, not just one or the other, but both of them together. So if you see a container that has in the add statement net raw and net bind service together, deny the pod. So using the all in operator, we can do that. And we're going to put those two values in the key statement. And we're going to check and see if all of those are in, not just one, not the other, but all of those are in the value of whatever specified for the add statement in a pod. And so if we look at an example of a bad pod here, I've got a pod that does add both of those. In addition, it adds a third one, sys shown, but it also adds the two that we don't want. So I should be able to block this pod. I'll create the policy, make sure the policy is ready, and apply bad pod. And we can see as expected, the all not in operator is blocked this because it sees that the two values were in the list of uh, add uh, the, the, the add array for this container. So it blocked that. And by comparison, if we look at a good pod that has one of the ones that we didn't want, but both of them, and the operator is all in, so we should be able to apply the good pod. And as expected, that's allowed. So all not in, pretty straightforward. Um, all these operators are really helpful in building either allow lists or deny lists, depending on how you build the expression. So that's all not in. And taking a look at our, or that's all in. And then if we take a look at all not in, uh, it's a basically an inversion of that statement where we can check and ensure that we deny, so it's a similar type of uh, similar type of expression, but we're saying deny a pod if these two, in this case, uh, capabilities within a drop statement are not in what's in the drop. So an inverted check there. So we should be able to look at a bad pod. First, let me get my policies. And I'll apply this policy. And so uh, bad pause says that we've got syschone and netbind service, but the policy said make sure that these two, all of these are not in that. And as expected, that has been denied. And then by contrast, if we look at a good pod, it does have both of those. So all of those. Those are, those are contain that value, and then that's created. Yeah, and there's a question from the audience. Um, how can we be notified whenever an audit action causes a pod to be blocked? And is there an alerting system like the one in Prometheus or something similar from Amir? So yes, by, by default, 
uh, and we mentioned this a, mo a minute ago, the validation failure action can be either enforce or audit. If it's an enforce, that means that the pod is going to be blocked, or whatever the resource is, is going to be blocked immediately. If it's in enforce mode or in audit mode, it will be allowed, but it'll report in a policy report object. So you can see these if you do, for example, cpol r is the alias for cluster policy report. I don't have anything there, and I don't have anything here. Uh, but there, there's nothing reported. But if I created that bad pod and the policy was in audit mode, I would be able to get the policy report for this namespace because a pod is a namespace resource and see that one of them had failed uh, the validation. And so that's a way for um, you or if you wanted to decouple that functionality and say, uh, you know, since it's just another custom resource, you can delegate that to like a security group and the security group has the ability to read those policy reports. You can get that information that way, which is a really helpful thing for your Caverno administrators to be able to create policies and then some other group to be able to just simply see what's going on. But the metric angle, um, we also do have Prometheus metrics that are exposed and yes, it will show uh, in those metrics and I don't remember what the exact one is offhand, but it will show uh, the a number of resources that have failed. You can go to the documentation, and uh, if there's a, if if anybody wants to post the link to that, um, there's a whole page on uh, monitoring with Prometheus and all of the metrics that are exposed. And we've also got a really cool project that's out there. It's uh, basically a front end, uh, a policy reporter front end that'll show you a lot of these things that are going on in a nice GUI that doesn't entail you having to roll your own. Uh, if you want to install that, it's an optional component. If you want to install it alongside Caverno, it'll give you a nice uh, web-based dashboard where you can go in and take a look and see you know, all of your policies and what your, uh, uh, what your audit status looks like. So several good tools there to help. Perfect. So we're getting all of those links to the chat. And I also want to say that thanks so much for everyone who said hi or greeting to the chat. Hello to all of you as well. Lovely that you joined today. And um, yeah, perfect. Cool. So I'm going to skip over uh, a couple uh, uh, of these just in the interest of time. Um, but uh, so talked about the first two. Similar type story with the other two. Um, you know, the, the, the gist of these is, it, we're providing much more granularity for you to be able to select exactly what it is that you want when you build an expression um, by saying either these things can, any of these things can be in, or all of these things can be in and vice versa. And so um, super pow powerful, they'll help uh, unlock new possibilities of either writing new types of policies or making existing policies better. Uh, and then the last two things here, uh, we now have support for integer ranges. Uh, and also, some of the existing operators like greater than, less than, et cetera, now support duration and uh, simver. Uh, a couple of these things aren't exactly in 1.6, but they bear, um, they bear uh, um, fleshing out or, or, or mentioning just because they're super powerful. So um, in looking at the, um, the range, I guess, first, so in this policy, we want to be able to check that a host port, so if you define a pod and it has a host port in it, this range operator is a simple way for you to express a large range of uh, ports. I mean, it's the, you could use it for any type of integer, but we've got 5,000 to 6,000. You can just simply write 5,000 dash, which is a range operator 6,000, and any pod that fits this, again, this is a James path expression here, um, it'll just be blocked. And so if we take a look at example of a bad pod, this is using host port 53, that should be denied. And so if we apply the policy that we just had a minute ago, which saying collect all of the containers, including ephemeral and init containers, look at the ports and look at the host ports. And if any of those are not in this range, deny it, because this is a deny rule. So we're gonna ask, Basically, 5,000 to 6,000 is our green range. Anything that falls outside of that is bad, so block it. And as you can see, our bad pod here specifies host port 53. DNS is generally not a great thing that you want users to expose on a host port. So let's see if we can apply a bad pod and skirt around that. 
And no, we can't. And by contrast, let's see what a good pod looks like. This specifies quad 5, 5555 five, five, five for the host port. Can we apply this one? Yes, we can, because this falls within the allowed range. So that one is allowed. Uh, and on the uh, greater than, so uh, just quickly on these, we'll go and show demos, but on the uh, the duration comparison and the Simver comparison, Caverno now natively understands Simver. So you can have something, again, another James Pash Path expression, which is going into a pod, because that's our kind, going to go look at the labeling version and going to get the value of it. And we're going to be able to compare that using the greater than. And, and it's going to natively understand, is this greater than 1.4.0? Well, you don't have to write any complex, you know, uh, substitution logic or, or scripting logic. You can just ask, hey, is the version greater than 1.4.0? If it is, block it. If it's not, allow it. So Caverno understands that in the value, and it also understands duration. So uh, in this case, the, the use case for this one might be, um, you know, if you, uh, particularly in audit mode, if you want to be able to be informed about pods that, maybe have run out there for over a week or a month or something and the images are you you want to have refreshed over time and you want to rebuild those pods you can have a label or whatever the the key is that expresses time and caverno with the with those operators now understands time so 12 hours it'll understand that 12 hours is greater than 11 hours and you can express it in minutes as well so a um, couple new capabilities to the existing operators in addition to the new operators that make it um, make it possible to write new types of policies as well as existing policies be much smoother and even consolidation of rules because that's another thing that you know you want to be able to express your intent in the most efficient manner possible and in some cases in the past it might have taken several rules to do that uh, even though those rules have been expressed you know fairly simply in that you're not programming what the rule is, you're just simply writing your intent. But now you can collapse those into one rule or a couple rules. Yeah, and there's an audience question once again. So, and I was asked, any recommendations on patterns and best practices around organizing and structuring policies for large multi-tenant clusters? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we should have a section on the website that kind of talks about what the organizational strategies that that uh, may be useful to you. But in general, you know, a Caverno cluster policy, well, a Caverno policy, regardless of whether it's a cluster policy, which is a cluster scoped resource or a policy, which is a namespace scoped resource, is really a container. The thing that matters are the rules. And so, um, we see in some cases that some users like to simply write cluster policy, like one cluster policy that has all of the validate rules, and maybe um, another cluster policy that has all of the mutate rules, or um, depending on you know what what they're trying to do, maybe there are a bunch of uh, there are a bunch of rules that they need to express for a specific type of resource, like for example you have a bunch of policy that you want to wrap around pods, but then you have another set of policy that you also want to wrap around like services, for example. Well, you could create two cluster policies and have your pod policies in one, your service policies in another, and a combination of that if you wanted to, and also the same type of thing when it comes to a namespace. So you can have a set of cluster policies, and also if you're delegating, especially in multi-tenant multi environments where you are going to delegate some of these uh, some of these functions to your namespace administrators, or however you, however you you uh, you call that, you probably want them to be able to set some policies, but they need to have the ability to define those. Well, you can define yours in a cluster policy. They can define theirs in a policy that you don't collide because one policy can't override another. They just simply extend whatever the conditions are. So, so there's a, there's a lot of ways to go about doing it, um, but at the end of the day. Caverno aims to be flexible and also simple with that flexibility to give you whatever the control that you need for your environment and for your, your customers, your users, you should be able to do that. Perfect. And then there was another one as well. 
um, from Amir. Uh, can we also generate other resources on validation, such as generating CVs or creating deploy, for example? So a generate rule is a specific type of rule in Caverno, and it's a different type from a validate policy. So a validate rule says it's like basically a yes or no answer. Like, here comes a resource. We want to take a look at it. Is it allowed? Yes or no. That's a validate rule. A generate rule is here comes a resource. Based on that and the criteria that's in the rule, what other resource should we create in response to that? So there are two separate rule types. They have to be expressed separately. But that, that's the purpose of a generate rule, is to generate a new resource. But it still has to match the criteria in the rule. So if the criteria isn't met, it doesn't deny the resource. It just says, all right, the pattern isn't what I'm looking for to create that resource, so I'm not going to do anything. Perfect. And OK, so we're a little behind here. So I'm probably going to have to skip over these, because we want to leave some more time for Q&A. Um, so we talked about James Path and what James Path is. Just a quick recap on that. It's a powerful uh, JSON query language. Um, if you're familiar with uh, JQ, uh, JQ's filtering application, James Path is similar to that, but it has a lot more um, things that are called filters that are built into it. And in this release, we've added a whole bunch more. And so I did want to show uh, some of these that were highlighted here. But since we're getting a little lower on time, I'll just mention that you know. Um, in addition to the existing filters, and you can go to the James Path uh, website and see all the ones that they have there, which are super helpful. We've also created a whole bunch of new ones, which allow you to um, do common operations like being able to divide and have Caverno understand what you know what the resources are in Kubernetes terms. That's one of the great things about Caverno is. Since it doesn't need, it doesn't require you to program. We try and build in as much of the logic as possible. So you can divide one resource, like a hundred millibytes, by another resource, fifty millibytes, and Caverno just does the math behind the scenes, and also the unit conversion. So that's similar with all of these others. Uh, time since the ability to look at, you know, a timestamp and an object and compare that to now or something else and make decisions on that. Without you having to write a bunch of logic, we've already done that. Um, path canonicalize the ability for you to uh, look at a path that's specified in like a host path and have that normalized. So there's just like one forward slash in between each path separation. So don't have the time to go into these, but urge you to go and look at uh, when it becomes available the documentation. Try these out. Um, but these are all new James Path filters that are coming in Caverno 1.6 that are not found in the upstream James Path library. Uh, also, uh, for each enhancement, so um, I'm just going to talk to these real quick because we're running out of time. For each is an ability in Caverno that we have to allow you to loop over uh, objects that are in an array. Uh, and one of the things that is coming in 1.6 is the ability to use JSON 6902 patches. Uh, to be able to to loop through objects in a for loop and do things like remove. So strategic merge gives you the ability to do like a customized style patch. But with JSON style patches, you can do things like specific removes. And so that's now supported. Uh, there's an element index variable, which uh, allows you to refer to what the specific index is that's being operated on. This kind of goes hand in hand with that JSON 6902 patch. Uh, element scope. Uh, the ability for you to uh, take a look at you know, what the high-level object or the, the field is in a certain resource. And if you need to operate outside of that, you can set this element scope field. And that allows you to basically pick and refer to any other field that may be in that resource. Um, also, context loops. Shuting showed this a little bit in some of our sample policies. but. Uh, but context can now be provided inside of a loop. So the, the use case that she showed was looking at uh, variables from an image, from an upstream uh, OCI registry. You want to look at metadata on an image. You can put that as a context inside of the loop and just iterate over those things. Um, policies and the, uh, the security sample policy. So for, for those that didn't know, um, Caverno has over 100 sample policies that you can download and use right now. And they're of all sorts of resources of all sorts of uh, across all of the Caverno rule types. And many of them are even outside of 
the Kubernetes core resource type. So we've got some there from traffic, some from, um, I think we've got some from Valero, some from Cert Manager. Um, so there's over a hundred of uh, policies that are out there that you can either download and use right now, or at the very least, they're great for teaching and, and giving you some concrete examples of how to, to build the policy that you want. And if you don't find the one that you're looking for, you can probably easily customize one that's there. Um, and if all of that fails, you can open up a, either a request or, or come to our Slack channel and tell us about what you're trying to solve and, and we'd be uh, interested to, to figure out how to do that. But there are, there are even more coming in 1.6 uh, with over 20. And then uh, lastly on this, um, the Kubernetes pod secure standards. This is a, 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 uh, a, a set of standards that, that, that explain what types of controls should be in an environment. Um, Caverno has built these uh, quite a while ago, but we've now refreshed these. Uh, with the capabilities that are in 1.6 and also that align with what the PSS is upstream. So uh, 18 or 19 new policies, over a thousand test resources uh, for just these pod security standard policies. Um, unfortunately, don't have time to, to show how these can be tested in the CLI, but, uh, but these are made available and um, they also cover, uh, they also cover the ephemeral containers, which is now uh, turned on by default in 1.23. And also one last note to mention that uh, for those of you that uh, have worked with Caverno policies, specifically validate policies, if you have a deny rule, uh, the autogen controller, the nice capability in Caverno that allows us to take the rule that you write pod and have that automatically translated for other pod level controllers like deployments, stateful sets, cron jobs, well, that now works for the deny rules as well. So that's another example of, of uh, us doing more of the work on your behalf and you being able to simplify your rules to just get what you want automatically. So um, just, to, just to quickly wrap up here, um, the, uh, really the summary of this release is adding more features that solve more use cases through policy. But you know, Caverno's model, motto is we want to do things easy, we want to do things intelligently, and we want to eliminate the burden of you having to express policy. Just get on with the job, make it easy. We're, we're trying to do more and more of that in 1.6. There's no programming required anywhere. It's very quick to get up and running. And as time goes on, we try and look at use cases, solve more of those problems, and build more capabilities into Caverno that allow you to do more stuff in less amount of time. Um, but also the other two themes of this release are less resource usage. You know, we, we know that clusters are becoming larger or people are using it. There, there's more stuff being thrown at them. So we want to reduce the resource usage to make it, make it, make it less uh, memory intensive and also more robust for your production use cases. You should be able to trust this. This is a, a, an element of security. So we're trying to put a lot of work into figuring out um, how we can make it more resilient, how we can make it more robust in the case of you know, these types of failures and other events that occur. And so there's a lot of work that's, that's been put through uh, in that regard. So, so yeah, that's, that's really the summary of, of what we have for you. And uh, if there's any time left, be glad to uh, take some Q&A here. Yeah, we have uh, about one minute, but we can, we can run through a quick okay. uh, question or so. So essentially, this is the last call for questions from the audience. So if you have anything, just ask now quickly, and we can get to it. And there was one question that got answered uh, with a quick note. Um, but just if you want to explore it further, there was a question from Amir. Are generated resources also validated? Uh, are generated resources shifting? Do you want to take that one? Uh, I think you're on mute, maybe. Okay, just, yeah, it's, it's just on mute. Um, yeah, you can verify the Kiverno generated resource by uh, adding another validated policy to your cluster. And there you can select on that specific resource using the, the label because Kiverno adds labels to its generated resource and use that to validate whatever configurations you want. Perfect. 
now we are not getting questions but we are getting compliments so great job beautiful video beautiful clarity for the team so uh great job uh, from everyone today so if there isn't any last questions then we are perfectly uh, on time here as well we did answer a lot of q a throughout the webinar as well so there was a lot of great interaction thank you so much everyone for that but yeah let's start wrapping things up so Thanks everyone for joining the latest episode of Cloud Native Live. It was great to have Verna here to talk about us, about their latest and greatest newest things. So we, I really have to say that so much interaction from the audience, amazing to see that. Thank you so much for all of the great questions. And as always, we bring you latest Cloud Native code every Wednesday, so you can tune in every week going further as well. And we have a great session next week in store as well. So thank you for joining us today and I'll see you next time. Thank you, Annie and Tyler.